You interviewed Dick McDonald in 1994, who, along with his brother, could arguably be called the most influential person in the history of fast food when they started McDonald's hamburgers. Tell us, how did this interview come about and what were your initial impressions of Dick McDonald when you first met him? In 1994, I was producing a documentary called Burger Town. It's about the, the history of the Southern California coffee shop, drive-in, and hamburger scene. And I went about producing this documentary, covering this, the history, post-World War II, up until 1997. Now, if you're gonna tell this story, you have to tell the story of the McDonald brothers in Southern California. The McDonald brothers were an essential component to the history of the burger and drive-in scene in Southern California. McDonald Brothers invented the speedy system of serving up hamburgers. And so I arranged to meet Dick McDonald through a gentleman, uh, through Jeffrey Tennyson. Jeffrey Tennyson wrote a book called Hamburger Heaven. And Jeffrey was in our documentary uh, as a historian. He talked about his book and he talked about the Southern California hamburger and drive-in scene, he was, he was wonderful. Jeffrey um, knew Dick McDonald because he interviewed him for his own book. And so we arranged to meet Dick McDonald. Then we uh, pulled up to uh, Dick McDonald's house. It was uh, a modest home by any you know, neighborhood standards. He comes greeting us with a big smile on his face. He had this resplendent brown suit on. He looked great. He had a matching pocket square, a tie. And what I remember about Dick at that particular moment, he was very jovial, very energetic. He just was happy to see us. And, and, he, was, and he was ready to tell us his story. And that story began in Depression Era, New Hampshire. Well, in those days, this would have been about 1928. Uh, the town we lived in, Manchester, was a mill town, uh, just about bankrupt. The town was down, and uh, there just were not any opportunities. So uh, you either worked in a shoe factory or you worked in a mill, and it was tough even getting a job there, too. So we knew we had to do something. So that was when, uh, through a distant relative of ours who had been in, in California many, many years and had gotten a job on the police department in, in Hollywood. So throughout the years, he got to know quite a few of the movie people. So uh, he told my brother, he said, uh, Mac, he says, if you want to come to Hollywood, he says, I can get your job at, uh, at one of the studios. So that was how it started. And then uh, uh, about a year later, my brother said, if you want to come out, I think we can show I got a job there. So uh, that was how that all, all started. Well, we were just really a couple of flunkies. Let's, let's be honest about it. We would push the sets around. Uh, we would drive the trucks, uh, take, the, uh, take the folks out on location if they were shooting location. We'd handle the lights, and uh, that was it. But, uh, but I loved it there. God, it was interesting, you know, for me just coming out from New Hampshire. And, uh, but my brother and I could see that there were no opportunities there. 20 years from now, we'd still be pushing the lights around and uh, pushing the sets and driving the trucks. So we knew we had to make, make a change. Yeah, we found this little rundown movie theater that this old gentleman really, he really wanted to unload the lease, see? And of course, we didn't have any money, so we heard about it through one of the boys on Film Row. So we went out to see this old gentleman, and uh, we said, now listen, we're going to lay it on the line. We don't have any money, but we think you want to get out from under this lease. So we'll take over the lease, and if we make any money, then we can sit down and talk about it. So uh, that was, and we ran that for, uh, oh, about seven years. And those were tough. Those were the depression years, you know, the 30s, 30, from 31 to about 38. And uh, everybody in the town was literally 
starving to death. The businessmen, you know, the uh, department store, drug store, novelty store, because nobody had any money. This was an orange grove town, and of course, people weren't buying oranges. So uh, those are those are tough, tough years. The only business making money in Depression era Los Angeles at the time was the food business. And so Dick and Mac decided to get into the food business themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a fellow in town had a little root beer and, uh, and a hot dog stand, a fellow named Walter Wiley. And he was doing most of the business in town. He was doing okay. So one, one day my brother said, you know, Dick, he says, I think we're in the wrong business. He says, Wiley's the only one making any, any money. So we built a little roadside stand near the Santa Anita racetrack. And uh, we, just, we just sold hot dogs and orange juice. And the reason for the orange juice was, as I said, this town we had the theater was Glendora. It was an orange grove town. We ran that from 1937 to 1940. And in 1940, in the meantime, uh, we had wanted to, to build a, a, a real drive-in, you know, get away from just the hot dogs and orange juice. But once again, uh, McDonald Brothers had a lot of ideas, but everything but money. <laughs> yeah, this was funny, we'd go to a bank, and this loan officer, you know, he'd look at us, and he looked down his nose at us, and he first thing, well, what do you boys have for collateral? <clears throat> we said, collateral? <laughs> what is collateral? All we have is a big smile. So, uh, they did, one after another, just, just turned us down. Well, we thought that uh, San Bernardino was a, a blue collar town, working man's town, and that's what we wanted. We weren't trying to get the country club set or the socialites. This thing we wanted to build, reasonable prices, and uh, San Bernardino seemed a logical city to, uh, to do that in. So when, when we opened <clears throat> with the car hops, that was in 1940, and the opening went relatively smoothly. We had been going through this thing with the car hops, and uh, so we didn't have any problems there. But one problem we, we began to have was the car hops and the fry cooks. And the fry cooks would want to date the car hops. And if they couldn't get a date, that poor car hops order was a little slow, a little slow getting to her. So, uh, oh yeah, but we, we laid down a law as far as them going out with the customers too. Right? And we said, if these fellas gonna come in and pick you gals up, you don't want to start you don't want to start with us. And one other thing, we said, if you have any intention, any intention of not working Friday and Saturday nights, you tell us now because it's just a waste of time filling out the application, but those were our two big nights. But it was a terribly slow, it was a slow system, uh, terribly slow. My brother and I would check, sit out on a lot, and first of all, the customer would come in and uh, the car hop would take the tray out and the menu. Then she'd go back to the drive-in. Then she'd go back out again. They weren't ready to order. Right? So they'd be back and forth a half a dozen times. And uh, the system just, uh, we, we could see that, uh, you know, we were kind of getting into an age of jet propulsion and this was really a hoss and buggy operation. So uh, that sort of put the idea, we knew we had to do something to speed, speed things up, yeah. Well, of course, in those days, the self-service bit was starting to come into vogue anyway. So uh, that sort of uh, put the idea into our head, but we wondered how the customers would accept being served in their cars for so many years. See, we, we were there from 1940 until 1948 with car hops and uh, Boy, they loved this, this car service, especially when it was rainy and, and, and so forth. But we, we decided to take the bull by the horns. And uh, we closed it down. And when people found out what we were gonna do, they thought we had gone insane. 
and you could, we had a great business. We had the most popular drive-in in town, and uh, people couldn't understand. They said, "My God, the McDonald brothers! I think that they're <laughs> they're, they're they're losing their minds." So, but that was it. There was just a case of complaints, and we could see that something had to had had to be done. They wanted the car hops, and they didn't want to have to get out of their cars. And also, of course, we had eliminated all nice glassware and dishes. Everything was on paper, and they weren't too happy about that. They just weren't happy about any part of it, and uh, made no bones about uh, about uh, letting us know it too. Well, it, it took off very slowly, very slowly. The first month, it was it was pitiful, you know. People would come in, they'd honk their horns, wanted a car hop. At night, they blinked their lights, they wanted a car hop. We had signs all over the place that people don't pay much attention to, uh, to signs. And this went on first month, in the second month, into the third month. It had picked up a little bit, but sometimes in the old days, we look out on the parking lot to be filled with cars. Now we look out there, probably three cars, and maybe two of them were our employees that were parked out there. So uh, it, was, it was tough. Three different times, we almost threw, threw in a towel because uh, we just couldn't get it off the ground. And uh, one day my brother said, you know, Dick, he says, that looks like this was a dumb idea. He said, what do you think? Should we <laughs> call back the car hops? Well, I said, if you want to do it, I'll, I'll go along. But our pride, God, our pride was hurt. See, I think this was going to be really a flop. So we decided, let's, let's try it. Let's hang on a little bit longer. So we did. Well, along about the end of the third month, it began to pick up a little. And we began to get uh, sales clerks, construction workers, cab drivers, and they loved the speed of it. Boy, they could come in, bingo. So from then on, the thing just took off. And another big factor, the youngsters loved it. They, for some reason, loved to go up to the windows and put the order in themselves, carry the tray out. They, the kids loved it. So of course, when we had the kids, we had mama and papa too. So as word began to spread through salesmen throughout the country, and we began to get a little publicity in the trade magazines. And the first thing we knew, people were converging on us to see what was what this was all about this we didn't call it fast food then we don't we didn't call it anything well when we decided to franchise we knew this oldest circular building that we had was obsolete and we knew that we had to have a new building so then we tried a couple of architects and they came up with these buildings, but they were low and squatty looking, like a, or oh, more like a Dairy Queen or something like that. So uh, one night I'm in my, I'm in my office and uh, I'm trying to do anything to get the building a little height. So at that time we, we lived in a big colonial house with uh, columns, four southern columns. So I drew in four columns. Well, they looked terrible. So then I drew in one arch running parallel with the uh, building, and that didn't look too bad. So uh, then I tried two arches, the way they eventually came out, and that seemed to lift, uh, lift the building up, and that's the story of the Golden Arches. Well, we, we tested among the, the old crew and the cooks and everything, different kinds of relishes and condiments and so forth. And it seems that the most popular ones were what we finally finally ended up with. And uh, uh, we didn't have too much of a problem with special orders, but we, we still, we hated to hear one because that really followed up the whole production line. Well, the way we were putting the condiments on a hamburger was with a wooden, large wooden spoon. We'd have a container of mustard and container of ketchup and so forth. And the boy would take a spoon and he put it in and put a dab of mustard. But he found out, he found out that he could speed his operation up. He'd take one spoon, he'd hit two or three hamburgers with it. So one hamburger would have this much ketchup, the other one would have, so we knew. So one day I, I went, to, went to L.A. and uh, 
I remember the little mint patties that the candy stores used to sell. So uh, I found this candy factory, and I went in and I said, could I speak to the, uh, the manager? And he said, yes. So a uh, nice young lady came out, and I said, uh, I'm a writer, and I said, I'm a freelance writer, and I would like to do a story on how candy's made, see? Oh, she said, come on. And I said, I don't know if I can get this printed anywhere, but I said, I'll, uh, I'll sure try. Oh, come on in, she said. So she started to take me through the whole operation, these big vats of chocolate, you know. But what I wanted was the mint patty, see? So I said, by the way, when I was a kid, I said, we used to buy those little mint peppermint patties. I said, how are those old? She said, we make those over here. And they had this marble table with wax paper on it. And they had this cone-shaped dispenser with a stick and a hole in the bottom. So they fill it with the con confectionery. And when they lifted the stick up, of course, a little daub of, of the confectionery came out. Boy, that's all I needed. I thought, that's, that's the answer. We'll do that with our mustard and ketchup. So I thanked her, and I said, you know, if I get this uh, in a magazine, I said, uh, I'll show her. And geez, I, I wouldn't dare tell you who would, what candy place, because she'd come out today if she's still alive and shoot me, probably. <clears throat> but anyhow, I, I went back to San Bernardino, and I said to my brother, I told him what had happened. So we had a machinist in town, used to do a lot of uh, experimental work for us. And, uh, so we told him about the cone shape. So he made the cone shape thing with the, with the stick and it, it worked pretty good, pretty well. But if they left, when they pull the stick up, if they left the stick out too much, you got too much. And if they pushed the stick in too quickly, you had a little dog. So his name was Ed Toman. So I said, Ed, isn't there some way you can put some kind of a lever so when they push it, well, he said, we'll try, but well, what a time he had with that, because the ketchup and the mustard would not always be the same consistency. So sometimes when we shot, there'd be too much drip through, but he, he, he finally, he finally uh, worked it out. So that Well, you know, we've, we came very close <clears throat> To, uh, to a discontinuing franchise. We, we had sold, I think, uh, oh, about 20 franchises. The first one was to a fellow named Neil Fox, uh, who bought it for Phoenix. And uh, Phil, uh, Fox had a lot of money. He had a chain of, uh, of uh, filling stations around Los Angeles. Well, he came to us with his partner, who had a fleet of salmon ships up in Seattle. And they wanted to quit the franchising, and they would put up all the money, and we'd have our own units. Okay? And they wanted to build them up, up and down the Pacific Coast first, and then keep, keep on going. So uh, we told Neil Fox, Neil, Neil, this is going to take an awful lot of money to, to get something like that. He says, we've got the money. Don't, don't worry about, about the money. But the more we thought about it, and you know, we'd been in business quite a while then, my brother and I, and we knew what was going to happen. We were going to have to run these, see? That was a, the, the stipulation with, uh, with Neil Falk. McDonald Brothers were going to run. Well, that would mean we'd be living in motels, we'd be traveling all over the country, we'd have all the grief of the problems, that are, and neither one of us had any kids. We had nobody to bring in, in, in into the business, and uh, we had a big meeting with Neil Fox, and his, uh, fellow, his name was Smith from Seattle. And uh, we said, well, we've decided to go the franchising route. We told him why. We said, well, and this will be a tough program. They'll have to do, get the locations, get the financing, get the buildings up and fight the zoning boards. We, we said, we wish you would have come to us about 20 years ago. Boy, we'd have kissed you, you know. <laughs> so, uh, first, our, our first I idea was was not for them to use the name McDonald's. We were just going to sell them the building, the design, the equipment layout. They could come to our place in San Bernardino for their training and with their managers, and then th that was it. See, flat fee, twenty five hundred bucks. That was it. We we had to have a franchise agent. 
We had to have a, 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 a company who could supervise these, these things. And uh, so that was how uh, we hired a franchise agent by the name Bill Tansy. And uh, Bill had been a sales manager of one of the big uh, either Arden Farms or Golden State Korean, one of those big outfits. And uh, very uh, typical salesman, just like Ray Kroc, you know, very aggressive. So uh, Bill started with us, and he sold about, I guess, about 20 franchises. And we opened, I think, nine places. But then Bill had, a, had some bad health problems, and he had to with, withdraw. We're about to hear Dick McDonald talk about Ray Kroc, and hear in his own words how their relationship started as, and how it ended. A film called The Founder was released in 2017, and it was a story about Ray Kroc and the McDonald brothers. Do you think Dick McDonald would have been happy about this movie, and why do you think so, if you do? Yes, I absolutely believe that Dick McDonald would have been happy with the movie The Founder. I was thinking those thoughts as, as I was watching the movie. I was thinking about my interview with Dick McDonald and things he was trying to convey to me. Uh, on the big screen, you see Ray Kroc in all his naked ambition and how he, you know, finessed the operation away from the McDonald brothers. It's, it's up there on the big screen. In the meantime, Ray Kroc <clears throat> had come out to see us because we had been selling so many of his milkshake machines. He was selling uh, uh, milkshake machines. So uh, that was good. He said, you're going to use some milk my milkshake machines in, in the McDonald's. We said, we intend to. It's a good product. So he went back to Chicago. About a week later, he called. And he said, say, I understand that you've uh, lost your franchise agent. And I said, we, he, we sure have. He said, how about me? So uh, his, the Miller mix of business was going downhill because the drugstores were taking out the soda fountains. They would raise big uh, customers like the drugstores, you know. Uh, and uh, so he could see that his business was, was going to be uh, we're going downhill. So that's how we said, well, come on out. We'll have a session with our attorney and see what we come up with. And, uh, Make a long story short, that's what we did. Hyde went to work, uh, Ray went to work as our franchise agent. The first time we talked to him, we could tell that he was very, very aggressive, very aggressive. And uh, which you have to be to be a salesman. And uh, he, was a, he was a typical, and they had a nice personality and a, and a terrific worker. We were very pleased to, uh, to have Ray Come, uh, come uh, with us. He went to work for us as a franchise agent in 1955 and worked for us till 1961. Now, during that entire period, there was never any mention of him being a founder of McDonald's. He was a franchise agent. But when we sold out to him, boy, we were shocked. We started reading the media, Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's. And, uh, so we weren't too, we weren't too, uh, too happy about that. We, we had a very strict contract with both Tansy and uh, we had the same contract with the Croc. They could not change a single item. They could not change the price. They could not add an item. They, they couldn't make a single change of any kind without the written approval of the McDonald brothers. And uh, that led to a little friction later on because Ray thought we were holding him down too much, but that was, uh, that was it. They had to get, get permission from McDonald Brothers to uh, any, any changes. Well, the deal was, as I recall it now, and we're going back now quite a few years, he was going to charge $1,900 for a franchise and 1.9% of their gross sales. McDonald Brothers were to get a half of 1% of, of the gross sales. And then uh, uh, he was running having too many many expenses, so we upped the down payment and so forth. But that was the initial payment. It was nineteen hundred dollars, plus uh, one point nine percent of their gross sales. There was a little friction began to build up because Ray thought we had too much control on him. See, 
Ray was a great idea man, and he'd have one probably every 15 minutes. But, <laughs> but some, of them, some of them were not gems. So they began to have a little friction back and forth there because he felt that, that uh, he was not given enough freedom on, on the thing. So one thing kind of led to another. One day my brother said, you know, poor Ray's, he's worried. He says, uh, let's tell him if he wants to give us $3 million. Uh, that's how we, if we give us $3 million in cash, he can forget the McDonald brothers. He really, yeah, he, he uh, next time we, we talked to him, we said, Ray, you know, you've been talking about wanting to buy us out. I said, this is the deal. We want three million bucks. And uh, so we said, there's gonna be a lot of taxes on this thing. So that was that was the whole thing. I think the finally, uh, after we paid all the taxes, uh, federal, in California had a stiff tax. Uh, I remember that my brother and I, we each had a million bucks in cash. Ray wanted to find us because he didn't have the about three, going to take about three million dollars in cash. So we said, no, Ray, it has to be a cash deal. So he was mad. He says, God, the McDonald brothers, they're millionaires now. He said, they, they don't need, they don't need this, this money. So uh, he said, uh, but we, we said, Ray, if, if we don't get the cash, we might as well go along with the, with the royalty deal. And uh, so he finally got it. And it's interesting, he got it from, there were four colleges. There were Princeton University, there was a women's college, Swarthmore, there was the Negro College, uh, Howard University. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, the Ford Foundation came in on that uh, deal, came up with the, uh, but Ray said later on, he said, uh, it actually cost me $18 million to buy out the McDonald brothers. He said, by the time I got through paying all the interest to these colleges for their loans, he says, I, it actually cost me 18 million bucks. I think the, this one thing is not take life too seriously. You're, you're, you have a very short span. I know many people, they, it looks to me like they think they're gonna live forever. I've got news for them. They're not gonna live forever. And I say, Try to enjoy it. Try to have some good friends that you can socialize with, and but relax. Don't get all tightened up. Don't be worrying about this and worrying about six months enough. It's not going to do you a bit of good. Take it easy and enjoy life. <laughs>